Okay, um, let's start with just reading through this portion. Would anybody? This portion. Verse 16 through the end of chapter 1. 16 through 21. Um, which one? The, which 16 one? On my side, okay. For we do not follow cleverly devised when we made they know to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. But we we <coughs> um, but when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was voice was blown to him by the majesty glory. This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the way to the end of the chapter. We ourselves hear this voice, this very voice from Rome from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, mm -hmm. and we have the that prophecy? prophetic word, prophetic word more fully confirmed, fully confirmed. To which you would, you will do very well to pay attention as to lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawn and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing for this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Amen. Okay, so we're closing out chapter one. He's kind of finishing his thoughts here. We have, he's laid out um, promises that through divine power, God has granted us what we need for godliness and holiness. Here are the promises that you have. He's given us all these things that he's told us and then um, kind of a encouragement to pursue godliness through virtue and this list of virtues that he's given to us. And then he kind of ends this last week with that you are constant need of reminders, which I just love that part. I think when, especially when he says for those who are established in their faith, those who not young believers, not people who have just become Christian, those who have been doing this a long time, you are in constant need of reminders of these things, of who he is, of his promises. You don't ever graduate from needing these reminders. You're never past these things of the gospel. Um, that to me is, I don't know, it just it gives me a sense of humility, I guess, and humbleness that I, I'm never going to graduate past these things. And um, thankful for when he does present those reminders to me in whatever shape or form that they come. Um, so then now he's kind of starting to take a shift in his tone as he gets ready for chapter two in which he's going to really kind of change his tone as far as more of a warning. Um, but he's wanting to say here and kind of give the emphasis of what I'm telling you is the truth. What I'm telling you is real. <coughs> and so in that time, so he's saying, we do not follow cleverly like devised myths. When we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are set apart from um, other teachers that you've had in the past who are false and as we know in chapter two, this is what he's going to be leading to and cleverly devised. So he's refuting critics that he's make that are making up lies to attract gullible followers. Apparently there are people that are saying Peter's just making these things up. Remember in that day and age, you have Greek mythology, you have all these different gods and you have all these very corrupt religious leaders who are funny enough you know, attracting followers through lies that sound like truth in order to gain their money and or sexual favors. How does that not sound 
somewhat familiar even now. I was just about to say it sounds familiar today. Yes, there's nothing new under the sun. We have been dealing with the same things since the early church. And so he's saying, he's refuting these um, and saying, no, actually, what we have been telling you, what we have been preaching to you for all these years is truth because of, and this is, I almost said interesting, <laughs> but I didn't. Um, cleverly devised, the Greek connotes sophisticated, subtly concocted ideas, lies disguised as divine truth, which when we get into chapter two is really going to um, lay a lot of light on even now the things that he's warning us against, that they don't look like lies. And that's how it gets you. It looks like divine truth. Um, and why there needs to be such fervent warning to be very careful about the false teachers that bring this cleverly devised myths. Um, <coughs> so when we did not follow clear, cleverly devised myths, this is not um, lies that were weaving into truth when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So basically he's saying, I was there. I saw. And what, what is he talking about here? Exactly. What, is he, what were they eyewitnesses to? Transfiguration. Yes. Um, that's what they are eyewitnesses to, but the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he's talking about the second coming. Mm -hmm. And so the word coming in verse 16 does refer to Christ's second coming, not just his first coming. The Greek word is actually used 18 times in the New Testament for the second coming and never to the first coming. And so <coughs> he's saying here, obviously he's already taught them that Christ is coming again and he's experienced the transfiguration, and was there personally. Therefore, there is a validity to what he is saying because they were eyewitnesses to it. I don't know if you've ever heard a story from someone, a compelling story, and then they're like, I read about it, or it was actually my friend that was there, my friend's cousin that was at this concert, and they saw this, per you know, it just, it loses a little bit of... I don't know. Validity. Validity, interesting. I don't know. There's, there's something about it. But then when you hear a story and that person says, I was there, I actually saw the person in concert. I saw the smoke. I saw the lights. There's something more powerful about it. <coughs> Excuse me. And so that's what he's doing here. He's saying we were there. We were eyewitnesses of this majesty. And then he's also taught that he is coming again, which... the power and coming of Christ were part of Peter's earlier teaching to these people. Um, as we can see in verse 16, where he says, already made it known. And we find out in chapter three that false teachers believe that the second coming was a myth. And so Peter is trying to refute this. And we'll see this in chapter three. Um, but this is, he's now laying out a foundational doctrine here. Well, no, he's not just laying it out. He's saying, this is essential. Christ has all power and authority, and he is coming. One of the marks of a living evangelical, evangelical faith is that we reckon seriously, earnestly, and joyfully the personal, visible return of Jesus Christ. Um, I don't know. Do y'all, is that something that y'all ever take the time to think about? The fact that he's coming again? And what does it do as far as how you think, how you approach life, how does it change anything for you in a sense when you think about it? I will say that growing up, I did not understand that thought process at all. I just thought I would hear my parents say that, and I'd think, 
why? I want to get married and have kids and experience life. And the older I get, I think. So Peter's saying here, we're not making this up. We're witnesses to trans- transfiguration. We were on that mountain witnessing the majesty of Christ and a witnessing a glimpse at the future majesty of his second coming. And did you notice that he used the word majesty both for God and for Christ um, and really makes a connection here of the deity of Christ um, when he, the voice speaks by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. And so this first part is just him saying, we're witnesses to what happened. We are witnesses not only to the transfiguration of Christ and the majesty and glory of who he is, and then the revealing, the revealing of God saying, this is my son, but we're also witnesses to, to a glimpse of what is coming for you in the future. So have hope. This is what you set your, your eyes on. This is what you set your heart on. Um, So let's read this next part. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. So the prophetic word here, he's talking about the glorious coming of the Messiah predicted in the Old Testament. And he's saying, okay, it's confirmed because we were witnesses to to this. So to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. What is he asking you to pay attention to as to a lamp shining in a dark place? Um, like how, that, how, <coughs> how that is your goal? How that is your, like, in the forefront of your mind? What? What are we having? God coming. The yeah. prophetic word. <coughs> Yes, the glorious coming of, of Messiah is predicted in the Old Testament. And he speaks of it as more sure now but has, because it has been confirmed on the Mount of Transfiguration in an eyewitness preview of its fulfillment. So he's saying here, pay attention to it. In the dark of the night, the hope of his coming, the future glory of Christ, and the fact that you are going to get to share in it. This is not all there is, you Christians. He's coming again, and this is what is what you focus on, what you look at. It's your what we talked about a few weeks ago, the buoy that you're keeping your eye on, that coming. And it is what changes your day-to-day life. It's what gives meaning to the small mundane, mundane things, that it has, it has value now because of the hope that you have that he's coming again. And it's a glory that you're going to get to share in. Um, and these Christians were persecuted. Mm-hmm. They were in severe persecution, so that changes their view for sure. Sure. And he knew he was about to die, so mm-hmm. it's the same. If you know the end of a story... Are you able, if you know that you're going to have a happy ending at the end, are you able to withstand certain things knowing what's coming? Yes, no. No. (laughs) When I ran, I ran a half marathon, uh, and I didn't train very well in Tyler. Um, And I wanted to die, I think, at, at mile eight. I was barely running. I was walking, and all my friends who had trained (laughs) were way ahead of me. But I could hear from several miles out the finish line, Um, and I could hear the music, and and then I could see people walking by with their medals and their food and their hot dogs and their beer. (laughs) And I just wanted to stop. But I knew... If I just kept going, I could endure. I could do this for another 25, 30 minutes because I knew that at the end was hot dogs and beer and a medal and all my friends were going to be there. It made the pain 
more bearable. Um, it allowed me to keep going when I, my legs just did not want to move anymore. And so Peter's saying here, in the darkness of the world, when you are being thrown temptations, when you are being thrown all, not just temptation, but the effects of a broken world and the fact that even things that you, like not temptations, just difficulty, just life, just oh, um, sickness, jobs, parenting, all the things that come with a broken and sinful world plus the temptation. What is it that you keep your eyes on? What is the hope that you continue to cling to? He's coming. He's coming again. Um, and so he's saying, pay attention. Look at that. Focus on that as to a lamp shining in a dark place. That is what's going to keep you going until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Did y'all, I heard y'all talking. What did y'all find the day dawns <coughs> and the morning star is referring to again? Like how bright it'll be when God comes back? So it, they're just both references, again, phrases that refer to the second coming. Um, he talks about it in Revelation 2.28 and 22.16. Uh, Revelation 22.16, Jesus says, I am the bright and morning star. And in Revelation 2.28, he promises, To him who conquers and keeps my works unto the end, I will give him the bright and morning star. Um, so he's saying, pay attention. He is coming. Keep your focus on that. Keep your hope on that. Um, until he comes again. That is what's going to keep you until that day, that glorious day. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This was a f gripping... <laughs> <laughs> gripping um, part of the scripture because apparently it was hard to translate the original Greek. It, in the English, it seems to be more clear, but apparently there's several different um, thoughts of translation that some people don't necessarily agree on. And the two lines of thinking are, is he talking about that the, the prophecy of scripture is not come from men, but from God in the way that it originated as far as scripture in general or in the way that we actually interpret it. Did anyone find that? I had to kind of study this and read it multiple times to even understand the two distinctions that they were talking about. Um, but the way that it's worded <coughs> and the the grammar of it, they are not sure, but the ESV leans towards the fact that there's no prophecy that comes from its own, someone's own interpretation in the way that we interpret it. Um, and then MacArthur thinks it's, he's talking to, about, he's referencing how it originated. Um, the Holy Spirit inspiring man. That makes more sense to me. What, that it was originated? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I was, you know, like it's not tainted by the voice of man. Like it's not, mm -hmm. you know, like it's straight Holy Spirit on the paper. <coughs> it's not tainted by my perception or mm -hmm. my understanding. It's just truth. Yes. Um, and then, you know, there are some that argue that he's talking about that you cannot interpret it like a man cannot interpret it on his own whim. He can't come up with it, the interpretation. It also has to be led by the Holy Spirit. Well, I think both are true. Right. I agree. I think, I think both are true. Um, I just thought that was funny that there was such a distinction between the two. But <coughs> now he's saying here that he's trying to hone in on the doctrine of the inerrancy of Scripture, the fact that this stuff is real. Uh, kind of what he started with that unlike these other teachings that people are giving to you, these false teachers, this is the actual truth and it is from God. It is not from men. All these other things that these false teachers are giving you are from men. And you can see how um, when you think of like really false doctrine, it is very, it's about the man. I mean, you think about kind of the Mormon line of view. Um, <laughs> 
doesn't it just sound like it's something a man would in, <laughs> invent? Like you end up with your own planet when <laughs> which you were a god with all your women, like all your multiple wives. It just it's it does. no um, chocolate, no soda. Like who does that? <laughs> right? Like, no, <laughs> no woman does that. <laughs> Being a god. Um. But he's saying here that it is, it is all given of the Lord. So the infallibility and the inerrancy of Scripture. And so just the importance of that. And that what you have is truth. This is what sets you apart. And what's interesting, Piper talks about, um, talks about that what you have is actually historical. It, you actually have proof, unlike other other teachings and other religions, you have actual historical proof that these things were true. Did you know that like the Bible has more original manuscripts um, that line up with one another over a period of 1500 years? There's thousands that all say the same thing and one will have been found in Europe and one will have been found in Asia and it's the same thing and when you line them up they say the exact same thing and it's actually funny because, like, as far as science, uh, people are like, yes, keep digging. The more that you dig, the more that you uncover just continues to prove our scripture mm -hmm. true on, like, scientific level, not just like, oh, we said that this is true. We actually have more copies. What is it, the Iliad, I think? We have three times as many more original manuscripts that go in line with that than things like the Iliad. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying that... Um, what you have is truth. I love it. Do you agree, Alexis? You agree? <coughs> um, I really liked also that at the way that it emphasizes um, no prophecy was ever produced by the wool man, but men spoke from God as they were carried. So it's this tension. We talked about this in my group that it's that weird mystery and tension of it is from the Holy Spirit. It was divinely given words of truth, but it was, but God used men in order to do it. And that, and along with that comes like their personalities, their backgrounds, their different styles. And there's a blending of the two in order to give you the scripture and this truth. But it is only from the Lord. And therefore, there it is the truth and it is inerrant. Um, <clears throat> we were also talking about in our group how, how beautiful that is and how it's reflective of the body that you need each other's perspectives of who Christ is and who God is um, because you do see a different side of him. So we were talking about how in the Gospels you have different perspectives of the life of Christ and you can kind of see there are different personalities coming out in the way that they're talking and presenting who Christ is and his life. And in the same way, I will never get a full picture of who Christ is without Ashley's picture of Christ in the way that she sees him and what he's done in her life and her background and her her things that she's gone through that I have not gone through. And in the same way, when you put together this combination of all of us, you see a bigger, more beautiful picture of who Christ is. Um, and so he's basically saying here at the end, Go to the scriptures, go daily, go long, go deep. And when you go, remember this, these are not mere words of man. They are the words of God. Men moved by the Holy Spirit from God. Seek his meaning and you will find the lamp for hope. For as the apostle Paul said, whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that by steadfastness and encouragement of the scriptures, men might have hope. Um, something I wanted to do, because I knew that this was not going to take that long tonight, as we're wrapping up chapter one, is to read read the whole thing together, um, and basically sum it up together. So, if anyone could take one through four, who said it? 
Okay, one through four, Jen. Five through nine. Okay. Oh. Who said it? Okay, and then Ash, you want to end it? Yeah. And when they're finished, just keep going. Diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal King of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established of them, established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that put the putting off of my body will be soon, as your Lord and Jesus as your Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. To the end. Mm -hmm. For we did not follow clearly devi cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So break it down for me. Yes. That's like the goal, like in my head, the goal, like we know it. You know, you know what he's saying in chapter one. So Simon Peter. There's a greeting. <laughs> there is a greeting. <laughs> so he greets them, and then he says, like, God has granted us his divine power yes. to give us everything that we need. He's greeting who? Let's start even okay. with that. Who is he? Remember the beginning, who he's talking to when he kind of levels it out, the playing field? Um, most, like the Christ most the same one that he greets in first Peter. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Believers of what? The of man. The yeah. Yes. Of equal. Same. Yes. That's what, one of the things that I loved so much. Kind of this humility and authority. But we're all of equal standing. Why? What have we been given? What does he outline here for the next few verses? What has God given to you? His righteousness. His righteousness. His divine power. No. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Access to himself. Yeah. Access to himself. Two things. Specifically. Precious, Precious and very great promises. What, how do we have access to these things? Through Jesus. And specifically. His divine. divine power through knowledge. And the knowledge. Mm -hmm. The knowledge of him. Remember what knowledge was? 
what it was specifically referring to, how it was a little bit different than other knowledges. Does anyone remember? Like <coughs> yes, yes, like a little bit deeper than just other, fra other um, translations of the word knowledge, where it was, I don't just know about you, I know you intimately, I know who you are. Yes, like I know what you're gonna say, I know what you're gonna do. Like I know Mark, I have knowledge of Mark because I've spent 18 years. I know when Mark walks in and he is had a, a little bit of a harder day because of his body language. I know him and that's what he's saying through that kind of knowledge. All right, so he's given us his power, his righteousness, precious and great promise, promises, and escape from sin. Yes. So because of these things, then what do we do? Make every effort to live a life that's an example of what God's <coughs> <does>. Yes. <coughs> Can anyone pop out some of those things and what they are? And what did it cap it off with? Love. Yes. Brotherly affection and love. So as you're growing in the knowledge of him and loving him more, it should be directly affecting your love for each other and your brotherly affection. What does it what does it mean when you're when you have these qualities and are increasing? What does it keep you from? <laughs> Being useless. I don't know if anyone else, but those words are very haunting to me. <laughs> As we continue to study this, being useless and unfruitful, what marks those that lack these qualities? And what does... Ineffective, unfruitful, blind, nearsighted. What do you remember what we talked about? What are we blind to? What are we nearsighted about? What is it not allowing us to see? <coughs> what he's given us or what he's done for Yes. Yes. You know, one thing that I've read was talking about, um, it was a picture of like closing your eyes to, like, mm -hmm. that it wasn't like being struck blind where you couldn't see, but mm -hmm. closing your eyes to and like turning mm -hmm. away which makes sense because he's speaking to believers. Mm -hmm. Which, as we see, and he continues to reiterate here, is so easy to do. Mm -hmm. To forget. Mm -hmm. To forget. I feel like it's instantaneous sometimes on a day-by-day -day basis if you're not being constantly reminded. So then he goes on to say what? Don't, you don't want to be closed-minded. You don't want to be blind. How do you, how do you not? What am I going to tell you now? Mm -hmm. And what is kind of his promise to them to help them not forget? Which I think is another example of how we are to be. Not to just seek out reminders for ourselves, but to be like, to have this kind of mentality as Peter and to remind each other in, in these things. So I think that is as simple sometimes and practical as tell, tell your friend what God did that week. Tell your friend what you're going through. Tell him how he, how he, I don't know, showed, revealed a sin to you and then produced virtue in that. Mm -hmm. Be vulnerable and open about those things. It's how, it's both ways. Like you need reminders, but we should also take up the mantle of reminding each other on daily, daily ways. I think that there's, I don't know what sermon I was listening to, but they were talking about how, you know, when you're having dinner, make it purposeful. Mm -hmm. When you're having people over, have people over, but make it purposeful so that when you leave, you have been reminded of who he is. You've been reminded of these truths. You might have been reminded of his goodness. Um, 
infuse that into your very, into your daily conversations, you know? Um, there's intention in it, I think, in how we can stir each other up in that way. It does not just happen. It's like the qualities that he was saying. They don't just happen. There has to be um, an active agent. Um, so we need reminders constantly, and we need to be reminding each other. And then to cap it off, what does he end with as he's beginning to transition to chapter two? He's coming. Yes. I've told you the truth. I saw it. I witnessed it. I witnessed his majesty. This is not not made up, a not made up story. I was there. And you know, when you when you think about this, you have people that were alive. You know, it's not like you can kind of make up a story because everyone has died. Like there are people now who lived through the, the Beatles or JFK, right? And so you can't necessarily say completely make up a story that has is not true at all because there are people that are like, actually, I was alive. That is not what happened. Um, he's saying, this is truth. I was there. I was a witness. And have hope. He's coming. And I, what I witnessed... Um, is just this, I don't, I don't want to say small representation, but it's a glimpse into the future of the actual majesty and glory. You can do this. You can remain steadfast. Keep it in focus. Keep looking at it and let it produce the steadfastness and endurance that you need to keep going. Let it be your light. Stay in the word. It's from, oh, last thing. What's he saying? How do we know it's truth? Who's it from? Who's this word in scripture? Not men. Not us dumb men. We didn't. It's from you have a God that has given you access to who he is kindly enough by the Holy Spirit. Isn't it interesting also that you saw all three? God, Jesus, Holy Spirit in this mm -hmm. chapter. I thought that was very cool. So that's chapter one. <laughs> nice wrap up, guys. Um, and so we'll leave off there. And he is about to really change a tone. And here is next week, we're going to see that authority that we were talking about in the beginning. You've seen like this loving, really encouraging, laying out things. And now he is which you have to remember, remember he's about to die. He knows he's about to die. He's leaving you with things that are really on his mind that he wants you to remember. These are some of his last chances. This is a very, why is this on his mind? Mm -hmm. There's a weight to the warning that he's about to give. There's a, that needs to be heeded. Heed? Is that hard? Heed? Um, <clears throat> and so... I would think about that and pray through that. When I initially started reading chapter two, I thought, I don't just think this, I feel like we can gloss over this quickly because I don't, just don't know how much it applies in this day and age when actually I think that's not true at all. Mm -hmm. It's quite opposite. So be praying and thinking through specifically for our day and age how chapter two is relevant and why that warning was very strong for them and still plays very much so in this day and age. So, excited.